a good ball. The flag stays down. Heaney! Oh! They scored again! It's Davis again! It's job done now! So everyone, welcome to the latest episode of the Northern Ireland podcast. Today we're joined by a man who has 54 caps for Northern Ireland, played in some memorable nights at the National Football Stadium at Windsor Park, and we all know he loves a good slide tackle. It's Stephen Craigie. <laughs> Thank How you. are we boys okay? Aye, very good, very Thanks. good. Thanks for joining us um, mm-hmm. and for giving us your time here. So basically what we wanted to talk about was about those famous nights really at Windsor Park and kind of the atmosphere that, that must have brought about and kind of how Windsor Park has that legendary feel about it yeah. in terms yeah. of the atmosphere that it creates. But what would be some of your me- memorable moments from those days yeah, under well, Laurie Sanchez? First of all, I think the stadium's changed an awful lot. Naturally, it's, it's you know more modernised. Uh, up to date, you know, all those kind of things. But I'm saying back when I played, Megan, it's only seven or eight years ago, uh, even, you know, before that, the uh, the stadium helped us just because it was old fashioned. You know, we had England coming, we had Spain, Italy, Germany, walking into the dressing rooms and thinking, what is this place? You know, the old <laughs> size stand was tight, it was compact, there wasn't a lot of space. You know, standing in the tall area, everybody was kind of squashed into one little small, you know, but but almost for us was like this is us. This is what we're all about. You know, making it uncomfortable for opponents to come and play. Um, I think you know, as an international player, your first memories is your debut. You know, or, or your first appearance at Windsor Park. Mine was again. I think it was Finland. Finland. I think it was Finland about two thousand four, even before that, actually two thousand two three. Um, so that moment of 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 um, going out in front of the fans, your family being there. That's the moment that will never leave you, you know. But as you go on and you start playing, you become a little bit more comfortable, you play more often. Um, the bigger games take, you know, precedence. We were probably renowned then, you know, back in 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7. For a country who could get one-off results, but at times couldn't really string six or seven results together within a campaign that would give us an opportunity to qualify. I know we did come close in, uh, for you in 2008. Um, so the England game jumps out only because of the, the high profile names. Actually, I, I played in the Star Sixes uh, at the start of January, and Keith Gillespie was there, and, and Fino was there, Mike Taylor was there. And, and we were almost talking about that as well, because uh, Michael Owen played that night, he played in the Star Sixes, and we were thinking from that night in the England team, the only one really missing was Gary Neville. I think, uh, was it Luke Young maybe? Might have played right back, mm-hmm. but the rest of the team was Beckham and Gerrard. Uh, Ashley Cole, I think, played, mm-hmm. uh, Wayne Rooney, you know, so these guys were superstars. The, the English based guys had been against them before. I was playing in Scotland, I had watched them TV, you know, so to actually be on the same pitch as them was a bit intimidating. I remember the late great Malcolm Brody doing a piece in the day before the game, or even the day of the game, he'd done a, an article in the press about the value of the England team and the value of the Northern Ireland team, you know, so it was like 90 million to about 4 million. I mean, I was going to say, what was your value then? Well, it's, <laughs> I think I was about 150 grand, and I think if Mother could have got 150 grand from me, they'd have bit your hand off. So <laughs> I think they were going to try and employ Malcolm as an agent, you know, in that respect. So so that was probably under Laurie Sanchez, you know, was the first real result where I wouldn't say he thought we could do something, but it, it was special for mm-hmm. me anyway, you know, and, I, and you know, I'm sure many of the guys still reminisce about it, still talk about those moments, those games. Of course, the lads have went and qualified for Euro 2016, so it, it, it drifts away. But people who, who played around my era, um, you know, they were the ones, you know, the England one was the one where jumped out that the family always want to talk about. Um, even supporters now still remember that night because it almost put us back in the map a little bit, you know, but almost fallen off the radar. Yeah. You know, struggled to score goals at a, a period of time, 12 or 13 games without goals. So, um, Nesli, that were special. Family wise as well, you know, I, my family used to go to all the home games and since they used to watch. You know the Man United players and the Arsenal players and the Liverpool players on TV. So I actually think that you know that their son, brother, cousin, nephew played it. You know against that team and won. And it was special. Uh, you mentioned about the kind of the big players coming over to the national stadium and mm-hmm. it being like uh, almost a small smaller event to them. Yeah. But recently, like our under twenty ones, for example, they played. Spain, a real small venue. These players are playing for Real Madrid, and yeah. they give them a really, really good match. Like, well done, yeah. What do you What do you think it is about it that, that means that that wee small venue that can really get into a big, big name's head? Well, a lot of these guys are are used to playing, especially the bigger nations, are used to playing in the world class stadiums. They're playing Champions League football. 
you know, I'm not talking the first team players, not even you know the young ones, but even the, the under twenty one Spanish players, they'll be at Real Madrid, they'll be at Barcelona. These facilities are phenomenal. You know, a lot of our guys, some are playing non league football, some are playing Irish league football, even in the Scottish Premiership. A lot of teams don't have their own training facility. They have, you know, decent pitch, but it, it's all kind of a lot of it's basic. Um, you know, so we're used to that kind of environment. You know, whereas people coming from the bigger nations, but you know, everything's perfect, pitch is lovely, stadiums are big. You know, nothing's as small and compact anymore. You know, so with Windsor Park, you know, being updated, it probably takes a little, let's say, a little bit of the edge away. You know, because the boys have you know competed and got the Euros and are, are, are still doing well. So. I think it's more a mentality thing. It almost gives us, it used to give us like the siege mentality of thinking, right, this is different for them. They're going to find it a little bit uncomfortable. And there's no point in it being uncomfortable in the, in, in the dressing rooms and surrounding areas if you go onto the pitch and you're passive. So that was the thing under Laurie, particularly, you know, and Ian Barnacliffe, I know Ian as well, worked with Ian and Motherwell. And it will be the same, you know, be different. Go out and make it an uncomfortable evening for them. Go and really get, you know, because the, the fans are close to the pitch there. Up for the game, you know they know it's a huge night for them as well. So, um, I think just having the edge and, and and making it a different game for them, I think that's what Northern Ireland teams have always tried to do. You know, I still speak still speak to guys like Jerry Armstrong and, and uh, Pat Jennings who, who, who have spoke to at different events, and they said, "Listen, we never used to dominate games. I know back in eighty two and eighty six qualified, he said we never went to win beat teams four and five nil. We still had the grind out results. We still had to do things a little bit different. They had to try and use." every advantage they possibly had that would help them. And I still think Northern Ireland teams are like that, you know. Um, as I say, back in the, the, the 2005, six. I mean, it's, I'm always going on, but Spain came in 2006, almost a year, a year and a day after we beat England. Um, and we thought, oh, I think Iceland had just beat us 3-0 on the Saturday. And we thought, oh, here we go. This could be anything. You know, but somehow the mentality changed in that four or five days. The fans started to believe these things. The uncomfortable nature of, of these guys coming to Windsor Park and going, what is this place? You know, it's a strange, you know, where's my massage table? Where's this? Where's that? So we thought, well, now we have to try and make it a little bit different. Of course, David, I, 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 I tell this story. I remember warming up and um, we're jogging across the pitch as, as it was uh, towards the um, North Stand. I remember David saying, David Haley saying, I, he said, I feel something special is going to happen tonight. And it was, it was a kind of weird thing in the air. It's just a weird, like, you get it now and again as a player. And little did I know it was going to be as special as that for him. You know, he's going to score a hat trick against Spain. But you just get little moments, you kind of hang on to it. I remember thinking, this does feel a bit. We've been beat 3 0 on the Saturday, you're thinking the fans are going to come, they're going to be a bit grumpy, they're going to have a go at us. But even from the warm up, they were behind us, and you thought, oh, this is a little bit different. So things like that stick in your mind, you know, and, and, and kind of drive you on and force you to do what you have to do. So Northern Ireland, using that siege mentality, probably back to your point, which I've kind of gone away from, but that siege mentality of Northern Ireland um, make it uncomfortable for people. Um, sticking together as a team, it, you know, was always big for us. We couldn't afford to go out and have four or five players playing well and four or five not. We'd struggle. We needed 10, 11 guys on their game at it, working for each other. If you get a setback, so what? You know, we're on with it. If only you could bottle those things up and use it every game as a manager, you'd be, you know, you'd be managing the biggest club in the world. So, uh, I think surely the siege mentality helped us. Hi, I'm Michael O'Neill, and you're listening to the Northern Ireland podcast. To bring it back to the Laurie Sanchez days, as we seem to have called them, and those wins against England, Spain, even Sweden, Sweden the two-one yeah. win against Sweden. Like, what what was it about those nights? Was there something beforehand that you guys, like you said, you had that kind of grit and determination mm -hmm. and that that kind of siege mentality? But was there something about Laurie Sanchez himself or the squad or the yeah. camaraderie you had at that time? I'll be honest, Laurie was the first one really who came in. And I and, uh, wouldn't say had a distinct plan, but, but was quite um, focused on what he was looking for. You know, he, he had a plan of how to play. I know that sounds silly back then, but he kind of broke people's game down a little bit more um, about certain areas of crossing. He came in and worked out that, you know, which is natural, the more crosses you put in the box, the more chance you have of scoring. I know that sounds silly, but crosses from certain areas of the pitch, how he would squeeze the game up, what he wanted from his wingers. He tried to get a relationship with his fullbacks, his wingers, and his centre forwards. If he's necessarily out of the pitch, I want the ball to go there. If he's not out of the pitch, only basic things. But it seemed to work. We seemed to get more crosses into the box. We seemed to get more goals. Listen, we had Dave at the time. You know, Dave was phenomenal at the time. Dave Haley scoring goals for fun, um, which naturally helps us. 
you know, when you've got some of your team who's going to score goals, like Kai, you know, when they qualified for you 2016, mm -hmm. someone in the campaign who scored goals, and even when things weren't going well, you thought you can maybe nick something. Laurie was quite focused on what he was doing. He came in with a plan um, to make us better, uh, to try and get results. And when you do then get results, it, it brings a little bit of confidence and players almost, without being disrespectful, players think, and talk to, them, and talk to each other. I mean, that's what he's talking about. Yeah, this actually works. You know, so you almost convince players. I remember the build up of the England game. It would be that Azerbaijan on the Saturday, 2 0. It was 2 0 at one thing he scored. And on the Sunday morning, I had a meeting and he said, Listen, we're playing in, well, on the Wednesday. Some of you don't believe you can win. Probably, you know, a few of you might believe. So we kind of went into that kind of psychology in the Monday morning. I think a few more of you believe now. And he almost was like convincing us the game the game came closer. I remember Chris Bird coming uh, turning on the Wednesday morning or the Tuesday man. I think we can win. And I was like, what? And even though I was kind of convinced myself I could, to hear another player actually saying, I think we can. From somebody who probably in the Sunday, Chris probably thinking, no chance. So just little things where you kind of get into your head. Of course you can convince players they can win all you want. They still have to go and do it. But, but we almost, had, from, from nowhere suddenly we thought, we actually could do this. You know, and, and once that kind of spreads, that kind of positive mentality, but once the game kicks off, as long as you don't get, you know, conceded in the first 10, 15 minutes, we knew that was, you know, that was crucial for us. I think they, they, they hit the bar and they had us in the back foot for most of the game. So you can do all the convincing you want to build up, but as the game goes on, you start playing it. The longer it went, we started to think, oh. And then when we scored, I remember thinking, uh oh, we're in trouble. You know, there's like 15 minutes to go on thinking, here we go. I mean, if we think it's been tough up to now, I wouldn't say we get through the game reasonably comfortable in the end, but just little things like that where he, he, he convinced players that we could do it. Um, the Spain one was probably a bigger one because it was a bit of loss, you know, against Iceland on the Saturday and we were getting battered left, right and centre and I thought, oh. So, you know, scoring first probably helped in that game. I think they, in fact, they scored first, day of equalising. And, and just little things, well, you, you kind of grow in the game, you know, so you can convince people all you want, but players grow in the game. And I think, you know, that kind of game we grew in. Sweden we did. Um, that even Himovich, Ferry Lindbergh, uh, you know, again, world class players are worth thinking. Can we really? But again, you have David who scored two wonderful goals, you know, which which gives us something to hang on to, really. And, you know, we've done that a lot of the time. You know, we scored, we got ahead, and we defended for our lives, and we hung in and made, made saves, and we made clearances, and, and, and that was how we were. You know, we weren't fluent, we were the most impressive team ever to watch, but we had a way of winning games. Um, and I think Lloyd's mentality and Lloyd's game plan. Um, certainly opened a few people's eyes. Uh, you had mentioned there that you were in the soccer sixes. So that's right, yeah. So if you were looking at, uh, if you were maybe going for a weekend with five aside or whatever, on a Friday night or something like that, who from the Laurie Sanchez days and, and including the, the current team would you would you take in your five aside team? Would I be the manager or would I be playing? Would I be the sub? I'd be number six. I'd, I'd, I'd be the sub. Who <laughs> um, <laughs> would I play? Well, I'd have to have Dave. Uh, but it would be Dave from 2005, not Dave from 2019. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sure he's still got the goal scoring knack, but uh, things have changed slightly for him. Uh, so Dave would be, listen, Dave was, you know, Dave could, could go on a Monday and Tuesday and sometimes not train, sometimes train at walking pace. And as he used to say to me, when the lights come on, big man, when the lights come on, I'm ready. I used, to, I used to think, how? Because, you know, I, I was always of the mentality that I had to train every day. I had to, you know, I had to live right, eat right. I'm not saying he didn't, but I'm, I, every training session I had to come off thinking, I convinced himself I've trained right, okay, I'm ready to go. But Dave was just like, you know, <laughs> through this point, the lights come on, he scored. You know, he, he came alive. So I'd have to have him in the team. Um, uh, Mike would have to be in goals, probably not based on his Star Six's performance. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 again, I'll be back in the day and, uh, you know, maybe an experienced goalkeeper, you know, and a great voice behind, you know, very you know, reassuring that if you're in trouble, he'd probably look after you. So, uh, Mike would be in goal. Aaron Hughes all day long. Aaron, one of the best players I've played with. Just his whole outlook in the game, his professionalism. You know, I see a couple of young Hearts players over the past few months saying that, you know, he's not been playing as much, Aaron, but his influence and his experience and actually learning of how to live to be a football player. You know, just that. And that's not even me talking about how good a player he was. You know, that's his off the field stuff. But as a player, listen, he covered my backside many a time. I used to say to him, I'm going to head this. If I don't head it, 
you better be there. And he used to say, I'll be there. And more often than that, he was. So, uh, and so and we used to room together, you know, so you, you almost built a bond. And it was nice to go in at the National Duty knowing you'd meet up with someone you respected and you all man. So, um, Steve Davis would have to be in the team as well, all day long. Dave will just, you know, even from a young age, coming in, I think it was his first call, it might have been around when I kind of got involved. 2005, was he 2005? Well, I was certainly on the trip. Canada. In a friendly right. against uh, Canada. Okay. At home. I, I was involved in that one, right? Mm -hmm. I think maybe his first trip away might have been Azerbaijan before that, I don't know. I don't know if he didn't get on, but I remember him on the trip. But I think, who's this young, scrawny kid coming in? But he could handle the football, you know? So I don't think anybody would pick a Northern Ireland team in the last 15 years and wouldn't have Steve Davis in it. Mm -hmm. You know, so have we got a goalkeeper, defender, a midfield player, and a striker? It depends what formation you're going for. Right? Well, and, well uh, that's made one of each. I need someone else to go and win as the game. <laughs> I, I, I could have picked Paddy in the court, but Paddy in the sixes didn't. didn't <laughs> he let you down. He right? didn't. Well, he didn't run back enough. He uh, saw he had a sore ankle. Well, he said, "Well, well to be fair, I, I know. I think he went for his. He, he rolled his studs. So Paddy, oh. Paddy's individual was terrific. You know, just his his ability to go. I remember we played a five aside or six aside, whatever it was. One day, I, we trained at Queens Park Rangers. We used to stay in London. There's a flat away somewhere. And then Paddy was in the opposite team, and he absolutely ripped us to shreds. Every time he got the ball, it was just. You know, touch shot, touch dribble goal, and you were thinking. I remember, I was, I think it was me and Aaron in the same team. We were thinking, how are we stopping this guy? Just that was his, you know, that was his size at the time. In small areas, being able to manipulate the ball, do a step over, take people out of the game, it, it was just phenomenal. But he still wouldn't be in that team. I mean, who would be, who would be my fifth player? Oh, I don't even think who. I, I, I'm going to be bored. I, I, I would have to put Johnny in, Johnny Evans. Not, not ba based on the. His international debut was against Spain, mm. and you at left back as a centre half playing left back, you would think he'd played there his, uh, his full career. You know, just the composure he showed, the confidence he had. Uh, I would have put Gareth in, but you don't get many set plays in five sides. Yeah. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so <laughs> you don't put him. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. don't put him put Gareth in. But Johnny was just, you know, I, I remember saying oh, about two thousand five or six. I thought Johnny could have played anywhere. He was that good with the ball, and you could see why he was at Manchester United. I always felt Johnny could have played as a holding midfield player. I think Michael played him there on a couple of away trips, and yeah, a couple of games over there. He's played there a few times. Yeah. Like but just because he got handled the ball, you know what he <laughs> what he uh, probably did. not Remember, uh, what he forgets is that other people sometimes aren't as good in the ball as him. So that little delay and tactic of waiting until you until he's under pressure before he used to give you the ball, and I just think Johnny, that, that doesn't really work. You know, so just you go and do it with the ball, I'll go and hit it and kick it, just don't be putting me under pressure. So uh, I think that wouldn't be a bad five side team. But if we Dave up front getting goals, but if Dave were dictating things, uh, Aaron and John at the back would, would keep things intact with making goals. So I think that wouldn't be bad. I'd be the manager of so which, which one of those guys are coming to you at the end and being like, I'll pay you next week? No, they'll pay me next week. Uh, <laughs> Left money in a car. I'll pay you next week. Uh, I would hope it would be Healy. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope it would be Healy. But he wouldn't pay up. <laughs> he wouldn't pay up. Finally, for myself, before we go into some fan questions, was just to say, obviously you've played against some great names across your career. Mm. Always I find fascinating is what shirt did you get at the end of I different know. games? I know. It's, it's, um, I get quite a lot, to be fair. You know, a lot of the boys get their jerseys away, which was fine, but I was always at the intent. I never knew where my next jersey would come from, as in I'm an next cat. I was quite respectful to think I might not get another cap out. So I always normally kept one and swap one. Um, a few family members have got some. Uh, you know, I know people think it's probably boring, but Pirlo, literally. Yeah. Uh, I got Michael Owens. I didn't have them, so that's not yeah. boring. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> probably the players I'll take that. Ibrahimovic, <laughs> Dimitri Berbatov, and um, we're getting his. There's some uh, five side there. Well, I know. It's not, it's not <laughs> got a team. Yeah. That probably would have been a better choice asking for a five side team with jerseys. <laughs> um, so, listen, things like that were, were uh, mementos for me to keep. You know, uh, I've got a daughter who's nine years of age and who, uh, well, she just thinks I'll work on football somewhere. You know, so maybe when she gets older, we can sit and they have a conversation and then maybe explain things. So, uh, but moments like that are just, I think, my old Javi. I was just too, I mean, actually, my claim to fame is that Raul never played. For Spain, again after we beat them at Windsor Park, he fell out with Aragon or Aragon as well. He was captain that night, and off memory and off uh, having looked at it, 
I don't think he ever played a game for Spain. And you were man marking that. Well, that, that was my next yeah. point. Was that, <laughs> I was going to say that. That I be. retired right away. Yeah. Either that or he was embarrassed he couldn't beat or score against the team that I was in. I'm not too sure which one it was. But, uh, you know, so, listen, great memories of, of what went on. International football for me was the pinnacle. You know, getting the chance to go meet up with a great bunch of guys, um, you know, from Northern Ireland who were fighting for the one cause. We, uh, you know, we may be a small country, but, you know, we took it with pride that we were representing that nation. Um, family travelled home and away watching games. You know, family members still speaking with the nights they used to go to Windsor Park, we used to go back to the house, have a glass of wine, discuss it all, dissect the game. Um, they loved the moments of going away, you know, seeing their brother and especially two brothers on TV and, and travel. Just the whole thing about it me was just amazing. Um, which is why even, you know, looking back to that Star Six, putting the jersey back on was almost like a buzz again. You know, I haven't really missed football since I retired six and a half years ago. But when I pulled the Northern Ireland jersey on for those, you know, those games, I thought, oh, Especially again, you know, and the guys met up and, and we spoke about games and more, and it was I just I kind of conflict, you know, kind of flooding back again. So, um, I feel very privileged to have played for Northern Ireland. Um, I enjoyed every minute of it, staff, players, supporters, you know, I, I hold in high regard. And it was, um, you know, to reach 50 caps for me was beyond the wildest dreams. You know, I you hear people saying they didn't have one or two, and most people would have been, but then when you get one or two, you want more naturally. But you know, to get 50. That 50th cap in, in Slovenia when I was allowed to captain the team. Uh, backs to the wall, performance, got battered and won 1 0. I think Corey Evans first yeah, around the national goal. Yeah. Craig Hathcock on the left hand side set it up. So uh, it just lives along in the memory. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the players do a whip around it and, and, and get you uh, a little you know, memento for it. It was a, some sort of bow or something like that, some vase. But I was away, <laughs> the boys all laugh, because I was away, always around my fruit. I used to love my fruit. I still do. So in the morning time, I had loads of fruit, and I was always eating fruit. So that night, I got the you know, boys gave me the presentation. They all sat, ah, oh, it's very nice. I said a couple of words. Open it up. And I thought, oh, that's going to be nice. I said, no, 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 in fact, come on, open it up. And as it opened up, the boys had filled it full of fruit. <laughs> there was bananas and grapes and oranges. And, and of course, they all had a chocolate bit, which was nice. But, you know, that, that's the kind of mentality we had. You know, everybody was in it together. We all liked you know, mocking each other and, and having a bit of fun. But ultimately, when the referee blew that whistle, we were all fighting for one another. So, uh, amazing times. Now we're going to do and head to the game, was it? Are you a Top Gun fan? No. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but my wife is. She'll, she'll be all over that, huh? She will. So, first question then. Hi Stephen, it's Chris here. Who's the hardest player you've ever had to mark? Not uh, Raoul, we know that. No, no. Because <laughs> I finished him off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in my dreams, in my dreams. We actually swapped jerseys that night, but goodness knows where mine is, but I know where his is. Uh, <laughs> hardest player I've played against? Oh my goodness. Henrik Larson was very good. He didn't play for Sweden, but, but for, for Celtic. It was interesting to read a piece recently where Samuel Eto'o said Henry, when he joined Barcelona, taught them how to be invisible. And I thought, that solves a lot of my problems. Because a lot of the time I played against him, I couldn't find him either. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was phenomenal as in, you used to look and think, there he is, cross coming into the box. He would score five yards and I'd think, how was he there? Was, his movement was just phenomenal. As a goal scorer, he didn't give you anything, didn't speak to you, didn't look at you, did nothing. Because he was so focused on what he had to do. So, uh, from a goal scoring perspective, Henry Larson would have been probably right up there. You know, it, it's his time at Celtic was just, you know, go, go, go all the time. So, um, guys like Ibrahimovic was a different kind of challenge. He was probably younger at the time, but he was physically strong. Um, and so, he didn't speak much either, but he was a bit kind of, you weren't allowed to tackle him, you weren't allowed to get too close. Just, you know, what? Sure. I mean, listen, that's all I could do, so that's what I had to do. So we certainly had a few words and ended up a falling out. Um, <laughs> probably, you know, uh, Piero, I know I'm not name dropping here, well I am, but he was he was a different kind of threat. He played further back the park, but every time he got the ball, literally I thought, I'm in trouble. Because he was always trying to place the ball down the side, and he put the ball in behind, you drop, and you think to yourself, no, he's never going to do it this time. And sure as goodness, the ball would be. So every time he got the ball, the game almost stopped to wait to see what he was going to do. 
So from a purely technical point of view, um, an individual ability in the game, the dominated period would have to be up there as well. As a defender, would you prefer a striker that's maybe a bit mouthy in your face, trying to rile you up a wee bit, than have someone like Larson that's like just kind of yeah. a ghost? Yeah, because you wanted to try and, and engage in some sort of conversation. You wanted to engage in something where they might you could be a little bad back, and you, you could probably try and put them off the game. But um, I'd be fair. A lot of the international ones probably just looked and thought, "Who's this guy? You know, who's he play for?" Mother, I want to see what. So you know, there was no real public concern from them, but. Uh, yeah, the ones who give you the serious look and, and ignore you, you think, oh, he actually means a bit of business. So, listen, you tried all different tricks and tried what you had to do. I think nowadays, as the game's moved on, I mean, there's no tackling really, is there? You know, so a few of the older fashioned, you know, central defenders would probably struggle to stay on the park nowadays. So, you'd have to try some other tactic. I think talking might be the one. Yeah, okay. When you beat Spain 3 2, do you believe that there's a possibility you could qualify for the Euros and were the back-to-back away defeats to Latvia and Iceland the most disappointing of your career? Oh, um, when we beat Spain, I remember my brother telling me after the icing game, there must have been a headline in the paper on, the, on the Tuesday or Wednesday or Sunday maybe. The Northern Ireland were due to share a £2 million pot if they qualified for Euro 2008. So we lost against Iceland on the on the, on, on the Saturday, and I remember my brother saying on, on the Wednesday night when we went through when Dave scored that wonderful goal again, uh, uh, the third one, they were three two. He said a boy in the front of the stand jumped up and shouted, "They're going for the two million." That's what he shouted. <laughs> They're going for it. And it was like my brother was like, he said, "I just laughed as if like, on that one goal we're going for two million. So, um, did we believe we could qualify? Probably not because we just lost the Iceland to beat Spain. We thought. This is not right here. But if someone had said to you, take three points out of the two games, mm. you'd probably said yes, just not on that kind of in that reflection. Uh, biggest disappointment, probably not qualifying for Euro 2008. The two defeats away to Latvia and Iceland, absolutely the most disappointing of my career because I didn't play. I was left out of the two games. Um, not that I would have made any difference or I might not have made a difference, but it still looks back. It's still a lot of people I speak to and they think, Nigel made a, a mistake. He, he should have played during the games. That's what managers are paid to do. The managers are paid to make the best choice of what they think. He didn't pick the team trying to get beat. He picked the team because he thought he could win. Um, we never really had a conversation about it. Uh, I think he done an article a few years later on one of the papers saying, you know, maybe the team selection is wrong. That's what happens. You know, managers are picked. They have to make these decisions. But you know, purely from an individual perspective, I was disappointed. I had played a lot of the games up till then. I finished the campaign after that and played played long after it. So. Um, it was disappointing, to say the least, that, 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 you know, because as a player, one, you always think you should play. Every player at every level thinks you should be playing, whether that's the case or not, who knows. But you always think you can make a difference. You always think you, know, you could have done something or helped the team or, you know, or, or, or got the result. Um, that lives in the past. But it's certainly you, when you look at that campaign, that was the two games where I could have got four points or even three points. We would have had a better chance of qualifying. So uh, absolutely the most disappointing, you know, two most disappointing games of my career. I remember that being such a big, big thing, a big decision at the time when, when you were left out. Is that something that you just kind of, you have to respect that decision or do yeah. you go knock on the door? Or? No, listen, I just, I just respect, I didn't want to go and see people. I didn't really like to do it. It just it wasn't my makeup. I know certain other players that played with would have been kicking doors down and, and, and having face-to-face arguments. And I don't think you achieve anything with that, you know. Um, after losing the first game, I thought, well, I might have a chance of the second game, so I'll, I'll focus on training and do what I have to do. So it was a big decision at the, t- you know, at the time because the, the team was almost set. Aaron missed those two games as well. Myself and Aaron were probably played centre on the fence most of the time together, and we played I don't know, 30 odd times together. But Aaron was missing as well. Aaron was out um, through injury. Uh, he wasn't fit for the Latvia game. I think he may have said he could have been fit for Iceland, but the option wasn't taken up to bring him over. So you're almost not simply losing your two central defenders, but you know you're losing a part of your team that has been reasonably successful. So, um, but now having moved into coaching, you can understand why managers make decisions. I've, I've picked teams and left people out because you have a gut instinct, or you know you used to have a bit better feeling for someone who thinks someone's played better. Um, but I don't hold that against people. I mean, I've seen the engine now. We've gone off a conversation. And he may even talk about. It, I don't know, but you know, it's not something I look back and think. You know, I really don't like him for that. At the time, you're disappointed, but you have to move on. Okay, that one was from Patrick McKenna. 
Mm-hmm. Hi, Stephen. It's Neil Bassett here. Just wondering what the mood was like in the camp whenever Lloyd Sanchez left. Did you feel like all hope was lost, or did you genuinely think that you could kick on and qualify? Uh, I think it was disappointment that Lloyd left. You know, because we had done so well and and, and um, he put us in a good position. We you know we thought we had progressed in his time in charge. Uh, I think Lloyd always had ambitions of managing at the top flight in club football. So, you know, once he had that opportunity to move on into the Premier League at the time, it's hard to turn that down, you know. Um, I imagine the finances Lloyd was involved with with regards to his wages compared to what Fulham were going off him would have been astronomical. Uh, no, right switch there. No. So, uh, is that Laurie? Laurie's <laughs> 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 not here. Not here. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah. Uh, well, he does a warning. <laughs> uh, take it easy on me, Stephen. Uh, so, I can understand why he left. You know, financially, that was a situation. But as a player, when he came in and, and, and kind of helped us a little bit, it was disappointment. You know, matching the fans were disappointed because you know we had progressed things nicely, but we were, were doing okay. Um, but uh, uh, international football is different because you don't see each other on a daily basis it's month to month so it'd be, it can be three or four months before you meet up again so you, you almost get on with it your focus becomes your club football it must be hard for an international manager coming in you know not knowing people not really seeing them seeing them for five days and not seeing them again so um, but once it, once Lloyd made the decision you know, he phoned a few people told us his reasons and it, you know, that's that's what happens, unfortunately. You know, people move on, so uh, disappointing. But you know, whether it changed the momentum or not, you know, we went close for you to you know, two thousand and eight. So um, maybe he might have played me in that fair nice <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could have qualified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. But no, listen, you understand his reasons. Did he not uh, offer you a move to Fulham? No, no, he didn't. No, oh. which was disappointing. I mean, I, I mean, I said I'd go and play for the reserves. I'd clean up and do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, he didn't take that on the offer. But he did go and sign Steve and, and Dave, didn't he? Signed Aaron. He did. Yeah. <laughs> he that, you know. So he was. What, I always told me he was missing one. Uh, you were the missing one. <laughs> Performing. Okay. Hello, Stephen. Warren McConnell here. If you could replace Chris Sutton with any other pundit, who would you tackle? If I could replace Chris Sutton with anybody, <laughs> that wouldn't really bother me. Um, if I could replace one, who, who would I tackle? Oh. We're talking pundit across any team. Yeah, yeah, he's passing any, the any, yeah, any pundit. I can't just pundit. say, honestly, that was. Uh, someone came and asked me a couple of weeks ago, what, you know, what, it's like I get asked all the time. It's, it's, uh, you think I'd never ever played football before? People don't remember the tackle. People don't remember the tackle. I mean, the world's most famous yeah, tackle. Yeah. yeah, with my clothes on. <laughs> uh, so they asked, a uh, guy said to me, what was it like to do that? <laughs> what was it? I says, we'll see whatever you, you know, however. You know, good you think it would be? He said, yeah. I said, double. That's why he's like, wow, thanks. I'm like, no problem. <laughs> um, I don't generally have a, a dislike for pundits. I've no one really that I would, if I could just do Chris again, then I'd, I'd be nice if I'd like one more glut. You know, that would probably be it. But listen, he, he, he's, um, he's kind of virtual, he's outspoken, but it almost, it stimulates you. When you're working beside him because you're thinking you've got to be on your guard you've no idea what he's going to say you've no idea what he's coming with um a lot of the time it's outrageous uh, you know a lot of the time there's a little bit of you know seriousness that and there's a lot of truth in it you know but i suppose it's how he brings it across is the way it is so he challenges you and, and he, he poses your problems <laughs> uh he catches you off guard a little bit but um yeah i, I think i just tag him again that'd be nice Hi, I'm Michael O'Neill, and you're listening to the Northern Ireland Podcast. Charity boxing match, you and Chris, who comes out on top? Well, Chris, Chris would probably be slightly heavier than me, so we'll have to we'll, we'll, we'll need some sort of um, compromise. <laughs> he's, he's not taller. I'm making excuses, aren't I? <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> get the gloves on, get on. But I, I've never had to speak to a couple of the boys, but I've had to have a word with Carl Frampton, so he gave me a couple of tips. He trained up, yeah. I'd watch that. That'll pretty much give you the victory, I think. <laughs> well, no, I don't know. I'm cramping in your corner. Well, you can train all you want, but it's, it's actually delivering on the day, so <laughs> you never know. Okay, and then just finally. I suppose what I want to know from Stephen Craig. Oh, sorry. Alright, it's uh, Basil here. You'll know me. Um, I suppose what I want to know from Stephen Craig is is he a Bon Jovi man or a Bruce Springsteen man? 
you know what, this is going to be sound really boring. Music, I, I'm not a big music fan. I listen to, I, I mean, my, my t- <laughs> so what was this, Bon Jovi or, or, or bon the boss, yeah. I, I'd probably rather have Bruce. Yeah, I'd probably have Bruce. I know, I wouldn't be a big Bon Jovi fan. Maybe the old song, but it wouldn't be something about it sitting. Uh, I used to I used to be the um, the resident DJ to the team when I played. Uh, and funny, we were at the Star Sixes and, we, and Warren Feeney. Feeney was asking for it again. Happy Hardcore. You know, the proper remixes, the proper yeah, old right. school. I remember I had, it on my, I had it on my room one day and Aaron said, get that in the dress. I said, no, the boys were like that. So I had it on the iPod, so I put it in the dress, the dress in bunkers. And we're like, whoa! Johnny <laughs> and Dave and, and, and Feeney and the boys were shouting. And, so every time we went away, Steve, where's your iPod? Get your iPod in, you know, get, get it in. So that's what we used to do. So that, that's, uh, but I could go from listening to that to then listening to Kenny Rogers. Mm. So my, my comparison of music is, and, and my taste is absolutely dreadful. Um, I like Kenny Rogers, I've been to see him, very, very good. Uh, but ha- Happy Hardcore with my kind of dance remix from the, from the 80s is it's my proper old school stuff. So. Uh, that gets you going on the but, but that's, yeah, yeah. But, but listen, it was just good because the boys used to dance about and see it and you could see the you know, I didn't want them to peak too early in the dressing room, so I had the kind of time when we put it on. But even then, you know, as I said on that trip, the boys were talking about females asking, What about your mate, buddy? You got it, where you got that music? So <laughs> it's nice to know you'll be remembered for something. <laughs> it was not for, but at least it was your music taste. I was going to say, that's a lot of pressure though, to be the DJ in the change room, is it not? If yeah, you put a stinker on after it, yeah, good. but it's kind of changed now. I'm guessing it's, uh, you know, a lot younger, more rap music and all that. I, I'm not into the modern day music at all, I, I'm not so. Um, Still a few older ones, Steve, Dave used to love it as well, Big G used to like it, Aaron's still there, Kyle's still there, Mike would have been there thereabouts, so he's still involved in it. So I'm sure if I went in there and put on my iPod, those guys would, would give me a little bit of moral support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a question for, for Michael uh, last time, It was uh, we thought it was pretty good. What's your favourite chippy in Northern Ireland? Well, he was asked chips or pizza, wasn't he? Yeah, he said he was that. more of a pizza, pizza man. Pizza man, yeah. see, but I would be more... Growing up in, 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 uh, in the humbling background in, in Cumber, uh, we would always have had on a Saturday, we'd always had, fit, well, I'd say fish and chip, but I had a uh, chip on a Saturday night. Mum, dad, two brothers. And we used to always, I used to always have a pasty. Pasty and chips. Now you come over here in Scotland, a pasty is something completely different. It's not something, it's not something deep fried, you get out of the, they still do pasties back home. The day, yeah, they're, yeah, not, they're, yeah, not, they're not really pink anymore, I don't yeah, think. No, I, I haven't had one for... <laughs> Cooked all the way through now. And, uh, I, I haven't yeah. had I used to, used to get one on a steak at, which steak I got, it was just, just a lot of meat. The goodness of what it was, but it was just deep fat fried. And amazing. So <laughs> that was a hard choice. I know what I am. I would just stick it in the frying pan and get on with it. So I would have said, uh, Chippy Shrine would be my choice. Um, and I said Chip Shop. Well, that been away since 1994, so I, I can't even tell you the last time I was in a chip shop in Northern Ireland. <laughs> so uh, I will say that there used to be two in Cumber, one Uncle Tom's in Cumber on Bridge Street. No, was that Bridge Street? It was, and then there was Harry Fraser's, there was also another one. So that would have been our choice of <laughs> chip shops in, uh, in Cumber. So Harry Fraser's and Uncle Tom's. Anybody who's listening to this from Cumber will know back in the day, Uncle Tom's and Harry Fraser's. Pasty from there was a, was a bit of Pasty from there was, was the answer. That was it on Saturday night. <laughs> and then the, me and the two brothers used to share a can of juice between us. So I'd fight a bit out to see who was drinking the most, but there you go. What would have been the drink of choice there? Uh, probably Fanta would have been there. Fanta? I mean, Fanta Orange would have, would have been the choice back then. You so. would have got a change of ever favour for all that as well back then, probably? Oh, you'd have got, yeah. Well, my mum and dad would probably have got it as well within that favour, but not now. <laughs> 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 I think a can of Coke's probably too quick, you know what I mean? Or a can of Fanta, so you have no chance of getting much after that. So. Yeah. But unfortunately, the diet's changed, and you know, now you're, you know, you have to look after yourself, so fish and chips are a, a rare commodity nowadays. Finally, just from me before we finish, would be just to talk about the current team quickly, and just what would be your sure. thoughts on 2019, obviously, tough games against Germany and Holland, but Estonia and Belarus at the start of the year. Do you think Euro 2020 is a possibility? We probably need... Uh, our first four games are Belarus and Estonia, is that right? Mm-hmm. Two of them, two away. So we probably need 12 points. And I know it's a big ask, and it's difficult going away from Belarus, but we've been to Azerbaijan, you know, mm-hmm. the, the last one won. Uh, we went to Bosnia, you know, we lost, but played very well. So I, I, we need maximum points from, the, from those games. Uh, then you can look at Holland and Germany, if anything, you get a bonus. You know, that may just help you a little bit. So. There's no doubt it's the hardest task possible 
Um, but that siege mentality, that you know, togetherness that, that the Northern Ireland teams have had, we have to trust and rely that that can get us through. Um, we probably need, like we saw in the Euro 2016 qualification, a qualification, we need someone who's going to get a good run of goals. We need mm-hmm. someone who can get eight, nine, ten goals. If that's the case, then it gives you something to defend, it gives you something to hang on to. So, I felt the Nations League were very unlucky. I thought uh, more pleasing on the eye actually to watch mm-hmm. than we had potentially in the build up to Euro 2016. I thought we knew how to win games in 2016. I think we were better, more pleasing in the eye, created more chances, more flair. So Michael has to find the balance. That's the tough bit as a manager. You're getting praised for how you played, you haven't won games. So mm-hmm. finding the balance will be tough. Um, you know, how you get your system and, and you know, have you right. But I know he's very meticulous on that. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that, 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 that if we can pick up points in the first four games, that we do have one big performance since the ones apart. We do have enough in us to beat Holland or Germany that wins apart. It's not going to be free flow, it's not going to be dominating the game, but I just think that we have something. That if we can at least beat one of them at home, nick a draw away somewhere, it could just be our time. So, uh, fingers crossed. Well, thank you for your time. Really Pleasure. insightful, absolutely brilliant. Um, so, thank you for listening to today's podcast. Obviously, as we've said before, if you want to um, get involved, if you have any thoughts or opinions on guests or questions, um, you can tweet us at Northern Ireland or you can send us an email at podcast at irishfa.com. But from all of us and Stephen, just thank you for listening and speak to you soon. Armstrong! Northern Ireland has scored for Armstrong. It's a good ball. The flag stays down. Heaney! Oh! He's scored again! It's Davis again! He's job done now!